Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Kings 23, and we're going to be kind of dovetailing in on 23.10 here. If you'll remember with me, in our last lesson, we're in the reforms of Josiah, and Josiah means whom Jehovah heals or founded on Jah. There's no reforms, there's no revival, there's no uh, change in a life from a heart of unrighteousness. Uh, there's no way to change and, and become righteous unless it is founded upon Jah, Yahweh. Unless it is something that God does when He heals you, He makes you whole through salvation by faith as you look to Him. And when we opened last week, we really, it was our memory verse. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And that's what the king has done as he told me and you to go. When he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, or baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I commanded you. And that's what God has called us to do. And this is what King Josiah has done here because of finding the book of the law in chapter 22. He was beginning to work on the temple. When you get saved, you really need to begin to understand that now you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. Second Corinthians 3.16, I think. And, and you're supposed to begin to do temple maintenance which is allowing the Holy Spirit to wash and cleanse you from the inside out to change who you are. So as that temple maintenance begins to go on, the first, the first um, thought that we usually have or the first inclination that we do is to do the works in our own strength. Oh, I see what we're supposed to do. Let's do this. And we begin to try to change. We begin to try to do things in our own strength. And the only thing that you can do in your own strength is cry out to God and surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and allow the Spirit of God to do the work. It's not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And what does the, what does the Spirit do? It takes the Word of God, the truth of God, the light, or if you would like to know that the word light, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it also means a fire. And if you really looked at the Old Testament testimony, what did he do with the children of Israel? He took them out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, and then he was a cloud by day to keep the sun, of uh, the, the real sun, from burning them and baking them, and then he was a fire by night to keep them warm. So he's this consuming fire. He, they were, he was leading them, but what was he leading them to? To trust him. He was leading them to a land of milk and honey. He was leading them to a place where everything was provided for them if they would just obey him and trust him for the inheritance. But they resisted him. They didn't listen to him. And they rejected him. All he was trying to do was take, he took them out of Egypt, right? Then he was taking Egypt out of them and learning to have them walk by faith. And it's the same thing he's doing with you and me as a people. He did it with a whole nation. Now he's doing it with the people. And he just says, I took you out of the world. I bought you with the precious blood of Jesus. Now I want to take the world and your sin nature out of you by washing and cleansing you as you learn truth, look at truth, and learn to obey truth. But you do it by surrendering to me. And that fire burns it out. See, God's a consuming fire. So as you follow the light of the world, really it's the, it, you're reading the truth, you're learning the truth, you're learning to walk by faith, and his fire leads you, and it burns out the dross in your life. And you go, and you're learning to say, wow, his ways are so much better than my ways. What, I mean, I would have done it this way, and I would have ended up in this ditch, and if I do it his way, I end up on the king's highway. I end up as royalty. I end up with this inheritance if I listen. But, you know, just as the children of Israel did, we all come to our Kadesh Barnea. They came to the Jordan. They came to the Kadesh Barnea. It's a valley of decision where you have to decide, am I going to believe God or look at what I see and turn back? 
And that's what they did. They looked at what they saw, the giants in the land, and they turned back. They rejected God's ways. They said, God's not big enough, God, to get me across the Jordan and into the promised land. And so often, that's what you and I do, especially if we don't let his light and his word and his truth burn out the dross. See, that's what, that's what really we see, a perfect example here in the Old Testament of a king who is allowing God to use his life to affect the lives around him because of revival in his heart from the word of God. He sets about doing what he can do in his little kingdom to burn up everything that doesn't agree with God. And none of the kings before him did it. In fact, a lot of times they would just bury something and they would throw a blanket over it. They'd hide it in the temple. They'd go, we're not doing that anymore. But as soon as the next king would come up, they would begin doing it again because they're set. And if you don't get rid of the root or the idol or the thing that is there, it's always in your sight. It's always there to go back to. If you don't burn the bridges, you'll always go back across them. So you're walking in the newness of life. But if you allow the old man to live, he'll take you down. Oh, yeah. He'll wrestle you down. He'll dominate you. So you have to be crucified with Christ. And it's, I no longer live, but the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. That's a spiritual thing. Faith is what you can't see. It's the, it's the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us. So we want to walk by faith. It's a spiritual walk. You might as well close your eyes. It would be better for you not to be able to see physically. Jesus said, didn't he? Pluck out your eye. Than to keep walking by sight and miss the faith. We want to walk by faith and not by sight. Following the author and the finisher of our faith. And so when we see the effect of, of the word of God on the life of the one Josiah, the one God heals, when we see the effect of that, what does he do? He does all that's in his power by God to go and burn and get rid of all these things. And we see in the first 10 verses last week where he just begins to get rid of them. We go, why were they there? We had the Hezekiah just, just, uh, just 40 years before we had Hezekiah's reforms. Why didn't he get rid of this stuff? Yeah, sure, his son Manasseh brought some stuff back, but where did he find it at? It's because others, the fathers, other fathers didn't destroy it. And see, we've been given a chance in Jesus for a new life, bought by the precious blood of Jesus, and we can be chain breakers. And we're supposed to just clean up our houses, not just our spiritual houses, but as men of God and fathers and people of God, we should clean out our physical houses so that those things aren't there later to go back to. And we've talked about this before. You should be burning up uh, your secular music. You should be getting rid of your secular books. You should be getting rid of everything that's not honoring to God in your physical house, but then in your spiritual house. And in your physical house, you can literally take it out back, put it in a burn pit, don't break any civil codes. I live in the country. Burn it. And you'll never go back to it. Get rid of it. And say, that's bad. But you have to first agree with God. See, that's what confessing is. It's agreeing with God. You have to first agree with God that it's evil, that it's bad, that it's an idol, that it's going to lead you back into the old life. And the problem is with our apostate Christianity is most of us will never hear a sermon that that is bad. And we will hang our dream catchers. We will, we will put all of our evil stuff up on the walls and we'll mix our Zen Buddhism and our yoga and everything that we're doing in with the church and we'll say there's nothing wrong with that. My heart isn't practicing yoga. My heart isn't practicing shamanism with this dream catcher. My heart isn't practicing sorcery with all this medication. I am just doing it because everybody else does it. Listen, we have to agree with God, not with everybody else. We need to agree with God and not live like our fathers have lived and do evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that our fathers did. If they've handed us something that is evil, apostate, broken, 
We need to get back to the work of the Spirit of God and the man of God, the woman of God, for the glory of God. And find out what the Word of God says we should be doing. You cannot get to the throne room. Listen, we're not going to be able to get to the throne room and say, well, my denomination, my pastor didn't tell me that. It's a personal relationship. And a personal relationship with the Spirit of God, which is God, very God, changes a life. It brings reforms. It brings revival. And it affects people around them. And if it creates the right revival in your heart, in your chair, people around you will see it. People around you will respond to it. But first of all, you have to begin to respond to it. And we see that... that Josiah in the first 10 verses so far he goes and he's not just going stop it, quit, don't he's burning it up with fire the same way God does he's a consuming fire either let him consume it today by obeying his word and saying Lord I see what your word is saying but I have no capacity to follow it I have no capacity to do it will you please do it by your spirit I surrender, help me you called me and you can do it. That's what his word says. I have called you and I will also do it. He will do it. He's already done it through the blood of Jesus. But we have to believe it by faith. That the power of sin is gone. The penalty of sin is gone. And soon the presence of sin will be gone. The practice he's working on right now. The four P's. It's interesting that we closed really... Um, Look at verse 9, and we're going to start in verse... Did we get done with 10? We're on verse 11, ain't we? But I had a little thought on verse 9. Uh, 23, 9, 2 Kings. Nevertheless, the priest of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. Now listen, that would be a statement that you would not look to be in the apostate northern kingdoms. Because they had the golden calves they were worshiping at. But they're already exiled into Assyria. This is the chapter where the southern kingdom is going to be exiled. And Josiah is going to be killed. Look what it says. They did the priests. These are the priests that are supposed to be serving God at the altar. And, and serving the people. They did not come. They, they, but it's the priests of the high places, right? Look. They didn't come up to the altar of the Lord. Where are they at then? They're at the altar of the high places. They're not the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. That's where they were supposed to be. They were always supposed to come to Jerusalem. That's where the presence of the Lord was at. But they didn't come to God's altar. They went to the high places altar. But what else did they do, Greg? But they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. So they said they were Christian. They said that I'm, I'm one of you. But they were always at the high places and never in the congregation, never in the fellowship, never living for God. They were never coming to the altar and allowing God to alter their life because of the blood of Jesus. They were never coming there to Jerusalem, which means teaching peace. They were always staying at their own high place. I'm okay, I said a prayer, and I'm out here chasing idols and living uh -huh. the American dream, but I'm not going to be involved with coming to the altar of God and bowing down and surrendering and teaching peace and being a witness. But I'll eat unleavened bread with you among the brethren. I'll eat at the same table and say I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to do the things that I need to do to be a Christian. Be careful with that type of living. It might be high living. It might look really good. But it's not living that bows down to God. And he defiled Topheth. Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire of Molech. And this is what they were doing. They had this. They, they would meet with God three times a day at the hours of prayer. But in the, in the middle of those times, they were taken and having sexual orgies. They would have children. And then they had hot molded statue of Molech that they would heat up with fire. And they would take their babies and they would sacrifice them to Molech. And they would scream and yell. And this is, this is what we're trying to bring into our country today. Is that it's, it's an abortion after the baby is born. 
make no mistake, California is writing a bill on it. They passed a bill about it. You can't do anything. It's a woman's right. What about God? Listen, you have a right to do what you want. But if you don't consider God in your decisions of what you think is right for your life, then he's not going to consider you in anything other than judgment at the end of the age when judgment comes. You will reap what you sow. You have to consider God in these things. It's a very sad thing. Get the other tape. We already talked about it. But it's akin to abortion. It's sacrificing kids. We used to call them uh, latchkey kids. You leave them at home. It was okay to do that at one time in our community. Now they want to do daycares all the time. Now we're doing somebody else watching our kid. But God has called us, make no mistake, to be responsible for our own children. To train them in the way that they're supposed to go. And there's nothing wrong with a woman being outside the home if she can take care of the kids and be outside the home. But really we need to get back to what God has told us to do. And it's nearly impossible in our broken world. We were talking about it yesterday or was it this morning, me and my wife. Just how the perfect, the perfect institution of marriage was. How perfect. It's the first institution that God ever created. When he, when he caused uh, uh, Adam to be asleep and he took out of his side a rib and he brought woman and he instituted marriage. And then he told him to be fruitful and multiply, which is family. And everything imaginable for life and godliness is learned in the marriage unit with a child. Everything about authority, everything about how we're supposed to live, everything is modeled out and supposed to be in that unit of marriage and family. And then the enemy rushes in and attacks it, and destroys it, and perverts it, and changes it. Listen to me. It's all there to train the next generation in how they're supposed to live. And what happened because the enemy attacked? Cain killed Abel. Murder. Death from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. We see he first attacked and killed God's institution of marriage, and they sinned against God. Instead of obeying, then they had children, and they, they sinned against God. And so death has been reigning ever since. And the only way to escape that is to be revived, to be healed by the blood of Jesus, and change your mind and say something different because of what God's Word says. He's a consuming fire. He's shining His light. And you can let that fire burn out with ease, with love and mercy. Or later, if you don't do it now, you can burn in hellfire. Because we're going to reap what we sow. And if we sow that now, then he'll change our lives. And we'll affect the people around us if we allow that fire to burn it out now. That's really the picture that you see here is Josiah and his heart. The heart of the kingdom being sanctified and cleansed and washed. And he's going according to what the book of the law says and burning up everything that doesn't line up with what God says. What God says to do. And it's a picture of your heart and my heart. This kingdom is a picture of your heart and my heart. Listen. Listen to this. God's judging anyway at the end of the age. In this, Josiah dies at 39 before the number 40 judgment. God is going to judge. His wrath is being poured out regardless. But he's given us a chance to escape the wrath. He said, my people are not appointed for wrath. We're not appointed for judgment. Christ took our judgment. Christ took our wrath. But we can't say we're still up at the high places living high and mighty and ignoring God and not bowing down to God and not coming to the altar of the Lord and we're not making sacrifices in Jerusalem and teaching peace and think that we're going to escape the judgment of God just because we said, I said a prayer. I believed. That's not going to do it. The demons believe and they tremble. The demons are going to burn in hell forever because they don't obey. They don't change their mind. And in fact, they can't because they were already in the presence of God once. And they already rebelled against him. And that's where we get our rebellion from. That same demon, the head of them, the devil. So let's look. We need to get back to what God has said in his word. That light and that light could be a light to your path. Or it could be a fire to burn out and sanctify and cleanse you. Or it could be a future judgment against you. Look at it right here. Let's look at John 12. 
John 12. I, I like to go here. I'm sorry. John 12 is one of the texts that I like to take people to. I don't know how to live. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Oh, what do I do now? What do I do next? Listen to me. Listen, it's not going to be a surprise at the judgment seat of Christ. We already have that which is judging us. Listen, if you wish to go study law, if you wish to go to a courtroom, if you wish to go drive drunk and you show up in the courtroom, they would show you a statute and says in Indiana, I see statutes such and such and such and such that you should not drink and operate a law. But if you do that, you've committed such and such a felony. Maybe it's a misdemeanor the first time. And then they would read it to you and you'd go, well, I didn't know. they go, ignorance of the law is no excuse. This is all knowable. You know that it's not permissible in society to drive your car. You might not have known the Indiana code for it, but you cannot drink and drive and you knew that, sir. And so now we've had a breathalyzer and you've blown over .08 and you are charged with this and you're going to be responsible for this regardless of what you say. Well, I, you should have known. You should have read the law. You should have learned the laws of the land, how it is to live peaceably among people physically and now here spiritually. Do you want to know what we're going to be judged by? Uh, it's, it's 1244. 48 is the verse we're going to get to. Then Jesus cried out and said, listen, Jesus is still speaking this. Jesus is still saying that. He's talking loud. Can you hear his voice? My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear his voice. They know him and they follow him. He cried out and said, he who believes in me. See, this is what we say. When we say a prayer and we go, I said that prayer. You trust in him. You make a covenant with him. Believes not in me, but in him who sent me. You're believing in the Father. It's the Father's message that Jesus is proclaiming to us. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. They're one. I have come as a fire into the world. You can read it that way because it means a fire. I have come as a light into the world. See, because even in darkness, listen, you used to have a torch. And you go, you go, I can't see. We didn't always have electricity. A fire would be just as good. It would be a fire on a stick that you hold up in the air and it would be a light where everybody could see it. A light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide, that's live, continue, remain in darkness, which is referring to evil. And if anyone hears, you got any ears to hear? My words... Hear him with your heart and does not believe. I do not judge him, Crema, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Soteria, salvation, deliver from the sin nature, deliver from darkness, deliver from evil. 48 is what I wanted you to get to. He who rejects, refuses me, does not believe in me. And does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. That's it, right there. Here it is. 66 books, 40 authors. It's written down. It's hidden in the Old Testament. It's revealed in the New Testament. And the Holy Spirit is here to teach us. And if we truly believe the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in our heart and says, Revive. Let's burn out the dross. Let's wash and cleanse the inside of you. Let's turn and change our mind and live a different way. And then we begin to see what Josiah is doing here as it, the word pierced his heart. And he begins to go about his entire area of where he can be and act out and do and perform the word of God. And he would say, why in the world didn't my fathers do this? And we all have this choice to make. So we get to verse 11. Then he removed the horses and the kings of Judah that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. That's Ra, sun god, Ra, Egyptian god. They still got it in them all these years later. At the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in the court and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. Now, now notice this, and, and I, I, we could be here forever, people. I'm in chapter 23, I don't know if we're going to get through with it tonight or not. I don't know what we're going to get through. But, but here's, here's what, as I read this text, 
These are at the entrance. These are at the gate. These are at the door. Here's some false gods being dedicated, blocking people from getting to Jesus, getting to the door of the temple. They won't come up and, and worship. They stay at the high places. They won't come to the Lord's altar in Jerusalem. And then they're putting people in front that keeps other people out and blocks it. This is the false priest. It, it's the false gods. It's the false... And, and listen... The horses and chariots you see in that chapter, verse 11, they speak of power and might of something else other than God. Psalms 20 and 7, one of our memory verses from way back, some trust in horses and some in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Name is always his character, his nature, his will, his authority. Well, chariots and horses of that day was like atomic bombs. That was if you, the more horses you had, the more chariots you had, the stronger you were. And it's talking about the strength of a false god at the door of the temple. And they put it there to run and run it around it and keep people from getting in. And these were what the kings did who said, we're serving God. We're here in Jerusalem and everybody's coming here. These are the kings that said they were serving God. Yeah, it's interesting that Nathan Melech, they buy the chamber of Nathan Melech. Nathan Melech means the gift of the king. And so, listen, any king that came to the throne in the southern kingdom of Judah at any time could have got rid of this stuff. But guess what? They didn't have the book of the law. Remember, that's what Josiah just got found, was the book of the law, and tore his clothes and said, oh my goodness, we are so far away. Our fathers have been handing down some apostate stuff, religion, and now we're already judged, and we're going to go the same way the northern tribes went. We're going to Assyria. We're going to get taken captive. Actually, they went to Babylon. But we're going to get taken captive because we're not obeying God. And I want to get my life right because judgment's already been pronounced. Listen, we said in the same place. Judgment has been them already been announced. Listen to me. The wages of sin is death. Judgment has been announced. But somebody came and took our place. Somebody came and died for us. And not only has judgment been announced, but the free gift of God has been announced where we do not have to go and take this judgment. But it is coming regardless. We can go down to our grave in peace. We can rest and we can continue to proclaim and make sure that people know and we can be a John the Baptist and make straight the way of the Lord and clear the path for other people to get to Jesus. Or we can keep doing evil in the presence of the Lord according to all that our fathers have done. We can make that choice. It's up to us. Because God has given his spirit. God has given us his word. Here is a road map for the king's highway to clean it up do as what his light says do what his word says do what his son did as an example when he came to earth and took flesh we're not going to get anywhere so these chariots he burned them up though notice he didn't just say stop doing that you quit it you shouldn't be doing that you said you're a man of God this is the temple of God this is the place of God he burned it up Listen, parents, you can't just say, stop doing that. You have to take it out of their lives. You have to get rid of it. And we have to ask for forgiveness when we haven't. And learn to do better. Verse 12. The altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, remember that, that was... That would have been Josiah's grandpa, which the kings of Judah had made. Notice it was the kings, plural, Judah had made. And the altars which Manasseh, Ahaz's son, or excuse me, Hezekiah's son. Maybe that would have been his great-grandpa, great-great-grandpa. They call him father anyway, because it didn't matter uh, if it was your actual, that's my father, like we say today. It could have been your grandpa, your great-grandpa, your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa. It could go all the way back to the devil. If you're still living in your sin nature, he's your father. Or you can have a new nature and a new father and a new home and a new way of life with a new heart. So that's how it works. The Ancient of Days can be your father. And we go all the way back. And we become sons 
just like Abraham, children of Abraham. Isn't that amazing how God does that? So the, the roof, see, this is their patios. Think about it because we have patios. And we have so much fun on our patios and we do all these crazy things on our patios. And they were having orgies and all kinds of stuff on their patios in the presence of God. And they made altars. And the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Notice that where they're at. He made some more altars. Remember them altars that he copied from another king? Or from Where was it from? Assyria? He liked the ones in Assyria. And he came back and he said, here, make these. And the priest made them. Listen, we're not talking about the northern tribes that were worshiping golden calves. We're talking about the people of God that had Jerusalem right there and they were worshiping God. See, because that's what sometimes we think when we're looking at the word of God. Man, the world is evil, isn't it? No, God is talking to his children. The Bible's talking to God's children. This book is spiritually discerned. It can't be discerned by the world. They go, oh man, we are messed up. No, it's God's children that this is written for. Those that say we believe in God so that we can read them. And it can be a fire. It can be a light. It can wash and cleanse us. At least that's the way I read it. And I fall so short of it. But I see what we're supposed to be doing with it. And how to confess it as sin before a holy God. So here they are on their patios and they've got these altars and we're mentioning the, the men that were really evil, Ahaz and, and Manasseh. Um, but look what Josiah does. The king broke down and pulverized there and threw their dust into the brook Kadron. The brook Kadron. He threw their dust into the Brook Kedron. Pulverized is beat down in the King James. He destroyed them. He overthrew them. By the way, Manasseh was causing to forget. Yeah, Manasseh, in this instance, that was originally uh, Joseph's son down in Egypt he named Manasseh because God was causing him to forget and then he had Ephraim which is fruitful but in this sense what they have done with these false altars, altars is causing them to forget the reforms of Hezekiah causing them to forget the word of God we need to be careful what altars we're building on our own patios where we're making up things that have nothing to do with the word of God and we make them into something that we do in the church that have nothing to do with God. And it makes us forget what we should be doing. But notice the, the, the difference of what Josiah is doing. He's not looking at it. He's not saying stop it. He's not saying quit. He's not covering it up with dirt. He's not trying to bury it. He's pulverizing it. He's burning it. He's destroying it completely so that it's no longer there. That's what we need to do in our hearts with the Word of God, by the strength of God, by the Spirit of God, is to recognize it as sin and say, Lord, I agree. Will you destroy it? I know you already took the, the punishment for it. You already take the power from it. And you want to take the practice of it from me so that one day when we leave, we can be in your presence forevermore. Brook Kadron. Remember that brook? This is the one that Jesus goes out of the upper room in chapter uh, 14, chapter 13 of John. And he goes to lower Jerusalem and he goes across the brook Kadron into the Garden of Gethsemane where he's met with a by Judas and a detachment of troops to be arrested. It's the brook Kadron. It's pretty interesting because we see David... In first or Second Samuel, we see David going out across it, and he's being pursued by his son, who's rebelled and took the kingdom. It's a, it's an amazing when you start to tie these things together and see the significance of what's going on there. He threw the dust in the brook Kedron. What or is that the oh, yeah thirteen? Then the king defiled the high places, 
that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built. Notice who it is, Solomon. Solomon means peace. He's the king of Israel, the wisest king ever, and he built for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, for Milcom, the abominations of the people of Ammon. And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and filled the places with the bones of men. Listen, listen. Why were they still there 300 years later? And, and you know, in our own lives, we can say the same thing. Years later after serving God, why is that still in our heart? Why has that not been burned up? Why, Lord, is it still existing? Why do we allow it to stay there? Why is it in my house still? Why do I still have them old records in the back closet in case I want to listen to them? Why is it that those magazines are still in that room? Why is it that these things are over there and I haven't cleaned my house up? Listen, we're talking 300 years later. How many kings later one comes and says, hey, we got to burn this down. We got to get rid of this. Now listen to this. The Mount of Corruption, that's actually the Mount of Olives, which is awesome. Listen to me, but it's been so evil and so much evil and high places and, and evil priests have been there that they're calling it the Mount of Corruption instead of the Mount of Olives. It's the favorite place for the heathens to build their altars and their shrines but it's really the Mount of Olives. And what is that significant? Listen to me. The Mount of Olives was the place where Jesus made his home when he came to earth. It was his habit to always go to the Mount of Olives to pray. And it's the habit of the devil to always try to corrupt the place of prayer. To always try to destroy the place of prayer. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer to all nations. And that's where a surrender happens that is in prayer. A place of dependency upon God. A place where even when you don't know what God's going to do or what he's trying to do, you say, here I am, Lord, I surrender. By meeting with him, this place of the Mount of Olives. Listen, I got some notes here. Um, Eleven times Jesus was here, the New Testament says, but it was his habit, it was his custom to go to the Mount of Olives. We were in chapter 8 of John at the very last line of chapter 7. I think it's verse 59 maybe. It says everybody went to their own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And then it was the next morning that they brought him the woman who was caught in adultery. And then it was him that declared, I am the light of the world. I am the fire of the world. But listen, it's the, it's the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, 3, they're sitting at, at, at the Mount of Olives when the boys say, when's all this going to happen? And he says, don't worry about times. Don't worry about when it's going to happen. What you need to do is worry about prayer. You need to worry about having your heart ready. You need to be worried. He didn't say that all. But I'm, making, I'm, I'm reading into the text. This is what he meant. You can start looking for signs and wonders. You can start looking for what time it is. You can start guessing on dates. Or you can surrender your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to burn out the dross. And you can pray. And you can get into the Word. And you can get into fellowship. And you can be the bride of Christ. You can be the one that's already going out and doing the reforms and affecting people around you. Instead of worrying about the world out here that's already going to burn. It's already under judgment. It's going to go to wrath. The only way you can affect it is to tell them the truth, no matter what they do to you, is to keep speaking truth. And they've effectively shut up the church. They've effectively shut up the witnesses in the street. And I'm not saying emphatically. God always has a remnant. But effectively, the church has been silenced and overtaken with false priests that stay up at the high places, but they never come to the altar of God. The Mount of Olives. Isn't that amazing? They called it corruption because there was so much corruption going on there. And then it tells us what Solomon did. You know why Solomon did this? Well, because he didn't trust the Lord in his older age. 
but because he had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. And everyone that he married, it was because other nations said, here's my daughter, marry her. And then as soon as he married into their kingdom, then she wanted a temple built because that was her God. And it brought in false gods. So who are we marrying in the world? See, we've been set free. Jesus has set us free. But then we go marry stuff in the world. And then it draws it back into our house, our spiritual house. We marry things in the world. Listen, one wife. One wife. Be married to one wife. Be married to one thing. Our marriage to Christ is first. Then what does he say in his authority and his word? Then the husband of one wife and a family, and train, and follow the word of God, and do it my way, walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship of one another, and all the authority is already laid out, yet here comes the enemy, here comes other people, here comes the liar, here comes all of this other instruction to get us to walk in a different way, to follow a false light, to follow something that's fake, to follow something that doesn't lead to Jesus, or to heaven, and so here goes Solomon. He built, and they're here, they're here 300 years later. He built uh, Ashtoreth, which is, is a star. It means star. It's Hollywood, the stars. It's a female deity of the Phoenicians. Remember that? Ashtoreth was, was when we had Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel's dad was a priest in Phoenicia, and that's who they serve was Ashtoreth. It's the female car, one of the female counterparts of Baal. Uh, uh, of the Sidonians, which means hunting. What are they hunting for? Souls to steal from God. And then Chemosh, which means a subduer. See, they wear you out. They subdue you. Chemosh, is, he, he was Moab of the Moabites. And where did the Moabites come from? They come from an incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughters. And then there was Milcom, which means great king. He was the national idol of the Ammonites. And he was also, the, the Ammonites are also from an incestuous relationship from Lot and his daughters. But when we believe in Jesus, we become of the relationship of Abraham by faith. We become adopted in. And these were all an abomination to God. It means they were disgusting. They were filthy. They're idolatrous. And it actually uses a word for a garment in Nahum 3.6. Uh, the abomination. Because we're clothed in something other than in Christ. And covered in his word. And so this is what Solomon built when he walked away from God. And then when he come back, he didn't destroy it. And God said, I'm not going to punish you for this. Uh, because you've repented, but I'm going to do it in your son's generation. And that's when Rehoboam takes the throne, when Solomon dies. And then Jeroboam comes and says, who has anything to do with Rehoboam? And he takes and they split the nation. And then you have Judah and a little bit of Benjamin. And you have the other ten tribes. And they go to the north and they make golden calves. And we have this craziness. Uh, and we're doing it again in the church. We're doing it again in the world. But he burned it all up. And what did he do? You go, well, that's already unclean. Well, it wasn't unclean for those who still worship God and still kept their legalism. But what did he do? He put dead men's bones on it. Now even the other ones, they know that that's unclean. You can't touch anything dead or you become clean. So this is why he's burning it up. And he's making sure that they see it's a grave. That they see it's death. That they see it's evil. And if you touch it, you're definitely going to be unclean. You can't go back to that place. You can't go back to these places when you see dead men's bones on them because you automatically become unclean. Remember, you want to fast forward, go all the way to the New Testament? And what did the Pharisees always do? They had them go out with whitewash and whitewash all the tombs. That's why Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, whitewashed sepulchers. They would whitewash them so that they would never accidentally touch a grave. So they put white paint all over them and so that they'd know that they would never touch it because they would be unclean. And they wouldn't better celebrate the things of God on the festival days if they touched a grave. So they made sure they could see them. So here he's putting all of this on there. And listen, the Spirit of God brings all of this to our side and says, that's evil, that's wrong, that's sin, this is not good. You don't need the Word. The Spirit of God dwells in you. 
and will tell you when it's bad. And it may be bad for you, and it's not bad for me. If the Spirit of God tells you not to do it, because it's going to lead you back to another grave. It's going to lead you back to something else. Anyway, you burn them up. Cut them down. Filled their places with bones of men so that they knew it was unclean and defiled and nobody would go there. 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, it's where one of the golden calves, and the high place which Jeroboam, remember what Jeroboam means? Anybody remember it? The people will contend. That's what Jeroboam means. The people will contend. And Jeroboam was the one that contended against Rehoboam, Solomon's son, caused him to split. But it was of God. Listen, we've got to get this right in the church. Listen to me clearly. It was of God. And anybody that tried to stop them from splitting would be fighting against God. See, because right now we have Babylon rising. And it's coming whether you want it or not. And it's of God. Because he's bringing the end of the age in judgment. And if you go out there fighting in a physical fight and try to stop it from happening, you're fighting against God and what he's doing. We have to be very careful because most Christians are fighting against God all week long. He's trying to sanctify and cleanse them and bring the things into their lives so they can die to self. And we go, I've been fighting with the devil all week long. And we're really fighting with the work of God. Instead of listening to the Spirit of God and being a witness for God and telling other people that they can see that the reforms of Jesus is upon our life. If we can call it the Reformation here. Listen, all of us can go out and argue with everybody. All of us can go out and live like the world. But we live differently because Jesus is in our life. And that's only by the grace of God. But notice what it says. Here's, here's, here's Jeroboam's epitaph. 15b. The son of Nebat, which means regard or aspect, who made Israel sin. Remember, he made the golden calves. He made them sin. He set up places, the high places. You can worship at these calves. Here's your gods. You don't have to go back to Jerusalem where the presence of God is. God had said you have to go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> you have to go to where I set up my presence at. Well, now that's in your heart. See, now, that's where the presence of God is. He's everywhere, but where he wants to meet with you is in your heart, in your place of residence, and do reform in your heart and burn out the dross and change who we are from the inside out. And that's why prayer the Mount of Olives is the place to go. So Jeroboam made Israel sin, had made both the altar and the high place. He broke down and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden images. Look what he's doing. He, I mean, we already know it's evil. We already know they're golden cats, but they didn't. They were there. They seen people living right along on them golden calves. They seen them living right along in Bethel and Samaria. They seen them going right along in these places. But he's crushing them. He's destroying them. He's burning them up. In verse 16, and as Josiah, as the one Yah has healed, turned. Listen, turning is what we need to do. Turn from ourselves. Turn to God. We need to, we need to turn. We need to change our mind. As he turned, he saw the tombs. Listen, when you turn, you'll start seeing all the dead man's bones. You'll see everything around you that's evil when you turn to God. He'll begin to show you the evil that is around us. That were there on the mountain. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it. It was already defiled, but now we know for sure it's defiled. According to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words, 
Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. What? And he said, Let him alone. Let no one move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Listen, we're talking about again 300 years before. If you look over in 1 Kings, am I going to find this? Ooh. This was prophesied by name. I don't know if I got my notes right. 1 Kings. I thought it was 11, but it's saying 13 in my margin. I hope that's right. Uh oh. Uh oh. Give me two shakes. Eleven fourteen. First Kings eleven. I thought it was eleven. But it's saying thirteen there. I don't want thirteen. Thirteen's another thing. Go to eleven. 14, is that right? That's terrible, Greg. Adam? Huh? Adam? Or Edomite? Or Edomite? Well, that definitely is not it. Where am I supposed to be? 721? I am sorry, guys. This is prophesied by name. And I had the note here. Oh, is that it? No. Well, this is another fine mess you've gotten me into. Ollie. That was the custom of the kings. That's why I'm not getting that. I'm in the wrong place. Hang on a minute, guys. What verse are we on? 13.2. My goodness, how would you do that, Greg? I was looking back at the pillars. 13.1, 1 Kings 13.1. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. See, the Lord told him to go there. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. He's not supposed to be burning incense. Priests do that. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, Altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. And of course, King Jeroboam says, Arrest him, and stretches out his hand, he turns to leprosy. But listen, this is what's going on right now. As you see this, he was mentioned by name, Josiah. Now listen, because Josiah is a type of Christ. Christ was mentioned by name. And Isaiah, a virgin. And this is the sign of virgin shall bear a child. Uh -huh. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. Listen, it was all prophesied. And it all happened exactly the way it's supposed to happen. If you know your Bible. The J Josiah was prophesied. He was spoken by name by the prophets. And here he is coming and he's doing exactly the judgment that was supposed to be done. But it's because of his life. It's because of who he is. But he's a king. And he's just a small type of Christ who's trying to do the right thing. And he even messes up and doesn't listen to God. And that's why he dies at the end of the chapter. He was warned not to do what he did. And he went out in a battle against the, uh, Pharaoh Necho. And he dies in battle because he wouldn't listen to God. And he got involved in a physical battle. Listen to me. So we see that this is proclaimed. This is done. And now he's doing everything that was said was going to be done 300 years later. Just as God's word is true here, it's also true about Jesus that he would come. That Emmanuel would come. That means God with us. That he would be born of a virgin. And it was Mary, which means their rebellion. And Jesus raises up and he dies for us and he takes our judgment. And 
then we move back. And you can study that longer and deeper. But I'm going to try to finish up here. I got 10 minutes of time and I got a lot of ground to cover. Don't know if I can do it. My cousin used to be married to this guy from North Carolina. He was in the Air Force. Oh, I'm interrupting your Bible study. Sorry. Yeah, if it has nothing to do with the Bible study, you are interrupting. Yeah. But if it has something to do with it, you're not. <laughs> Verse 19. Now Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria. You got any shrines in your high places? You got any things that you're hanging on to and you say, I'm going to keep this? Listen, we need to let the word of God change our hearts, burn out the dross. I don't need to look back. I'm a new creation now. I know the truth. The spirit is leading me in truth. Burn it up. Let God burn it up. Lay it down. Give it over. He's the one that can deal with it. Which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord. Notice what happened. All these kings make it and it provokes the Lord to wrath, to anger. And he did to them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. He executed, listen, he executed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them. And he returned to Jerusalem. Listen, you got any, you got any gurus still in your life? You got any people that you think that, that don't know Jesus, but you think they're still cool? You think that they still are the gurus? They're the high priest? Listen, I'm serious. Because there's a whole lot of hobby things out there. There's a whole lot of sports things out there. There's a whole lot of things that we lift these people up like Hollywood. And we elevate them to a place they should not be, and we need to burn them up. And we need to make our plumb line the Word of God and a relationship with God and the Spirit of God and not try to put people on high that have nothing to do with God but lead us away to worship in high places because they need to be burned up. And then we need to return to where? Jerusalem, where the presence of God is. Jerusalem, where we're teaching peace. And the only way to teach peace is to tell people that Jesus is the peace. He's the only propitiation that's coming. The only payment for our sins. Then the king commanded all the people saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God. As it is written in the book of the covenant, such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of, Josiah, of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord. Listen to me. He's 26 years old now. The first Passover he's ever celebrated. They haven't been doing it the whole time that we've had kings. Nobody's doing the Passover. Now why is that significant? We're talking about death. And it was Passover and not kill you. And it was commanded that they do that in Exodus chapter 12. To remember that they were delivered out of the world. It was to remember that the Lord delivered them out with all their tribes in the night that the Passover festival was held. It was to have fellowship with God and a meal with God and to remember he was the power, he was the might, he was the strength. And they looked forward to a Messiah coming, the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb that would take away the sins of the world. Well, listen, on the last night of Jesus' life, before he went across that brook Kedron we were talking about, what did he do? He celebrated the final Passover because he was the Passover lamb. And then he instituted for the church the institution of communion, co-union together where we're one as a body. And now we look back at that, and yet most people don't take communion. Most people don't look back at what Christ has done for us and keep focused upon that because it's his power, his might, his strength, his kingdom. And he gave them a festival to look forward and they didn't celebrate it and they forgot him and they built up all this false religion and apostasy and now the church doesn't celebrate communion the way that they should. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It's to bring us to mind that what God has done it's to bring us to mind that we are sinners that needed a Savior, and we've been saved, and now we're free to go out and teach other people about peace. And we're waiting for him to come again. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing, that he rose again. 
Communion is very important. You don't have to do it with a church. You can do it with your family as the priest of your family. You can do it just with and teach your kids about what's going on. Listen to me. They hadn't done it. Had they have been keeping the Passover, they would have all been reminded and they would have been doing what? Tearing down these things that are in God's house, in God's place. And that's what we're doing. Listen to me, because what did the Passover require? You, for the Passover, you would go into your house and you would get everything with leaven in it, which was, which was a reminder of the, the influence of evil in your house. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And it's for us to clean up our houses, our, our physical houses, yes, but more importantly, our spiritual houses. Because if you clean up the spiritual house by spending time with God and let Him search your heart and know you and try to know your anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in you and lead you in the way everlasting, then you'll go clean up your physical house. And that's what the Passover was about. It's what communion is about. Remembering our marriage vows and remembering Him until He comes and remembering that we're supposed to be about His business and be witnesses for Him about the ministry of reconciliation of souls. And so they instantly, in the midst of all this, when he realizes what's happened, he's reading the book of the law, he says, we need to celebrate the Passover now. We've cleaned up these things. Let's clean up our hearts. Let's remember from where we have fallen and to return to our first love. So they celebrate it, and it's before the Lord, and it's of the Lord. And then he says in verse 24, Moreover, Josiah put away. If you look up put away, it means burned. Put away is burned those who consulted mediums and spiritus and the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. Why? That he might perform the words of the law which are written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Notice again why he's doing what he's doing because it's written in the word of God that's been found. It's written in the word of God. It's the instruction of God. Those that consult mediums and spiritists Listen, that's, it's all over our culture today. We have witches and warlocks and the rise of evil. We have people that are listening to this stuff. The music is singing about this stuff. The movies are doing it in every single movie. And we're watching it and being part of it. And you're letting it be entertaining your heart while you do it. Listen, we've got to deal with this. We've got to kill them. Now, I'm not talking about going out with physical weapons. But you need to kill them in your heart. Kill them in your life. Make sure that they're burned down and removed. And you're not letting the TV bring that stuff through that has mediums and, and spiritists and, and, and horoscope and those that consult. Oh, what do they do? They consult mediums. Let's read it. Uh, the, the, the workers with familiar spirits. That's what it is in the King James. See, because we keep changing it. To make it sound like it's okay. All they're doing is consulting them. No, they're worshiping familiar spirits. That's demons. That tell you how to write books. That tell you how to start programs. That tell you how to get around and pervert the word of God. We see it in the Antichrist priest. And the Antichrist teachers. And the apostate church like Andy Stanley and people. They're being given a message from spiritists. They're being given a message from familiar spirits. Wizards is what mediums is. In the King James, it's one who conjures spells or uh, uh, chases ghosts. See, we miss that too. We call it a spirit today. The Old Test or the the New the King James calls it a ghost. It's the Holy Ghost, and then we remember that it's a spirit. But it's a ghost. Everybody's afraid of ghosts. Where we used to be, now we think we can go out and just play with them and chase them. And we deal with these spirits, which there's no real ghost of your uncle out there. It's appointed for man to die once and then comes the judgment. All there is is a lying spirit out there trying to make you think it's your uncle. To make you think it's somebody else when it's not. And it wants you to follow what that spirit's saying and make you think it's your loved one from the grave. But it's not. It just It's a familiar spirit, so it's familiar with you, it's familiar with sin, it's familiar with the area, and so it can talk about things to tell you or reveal things to you that it's familiar with, 
and deceive you. We want God's Spirit. As many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. Not wizards. We don't play with wizards. Wizards are magicians. Wizards are liars. Wizards are demons. And if they don't repent, they're going to be consumed with fire and hell. All of these things can be saved if they repent and come to Jesus. Not the demon spirits, but the people that are consulting them. The people that are asking them for advice. Twenty-five. Listen to what to happen because of all that he did. Now this is his testimony. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, with all his soul, with all his might. According to the, all the law of Moses. Notice it was according to the word of God. He didn't turn to God and do what he wanted to do. He didn't turn to God and just go, Ah, I'm zealous for God. He did it according to the authority of scripture. Not after him did any arise like him. Nope. He was a type of Christ. There's so many types of Christ in the Old Testament. But Jesus is the perfect Christ. These are all fallible. That's the only king that rose after him that did more than he did because he does all of this. He burns out the dross in our life. Are you going to let him? Now notice this. What he, notice the testimony of what Josiah did. But notice God's still doing what he did. Look, nevertheless, he's the greatest king ever. Nevertheless, Jesus came and died for all the sins of the world. Nevertheless, wrath is coming. Nevertheless, judgment is coming for all those who won't believe in Jesus. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from his fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger was aroused against Judah because of the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I removed Israel, which is the northern kingdom, Judah is the southern, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house which I said, my name shall be there. Listen, name is his character, his nature, his authority. It's the place he put his name, and it's the place where they were supposed to meet with him. It was the place that he said, but he's still going to bring the wrath. Just like if you believe in Jesus, the wrath is still coming. God's wrath is still going to be poured out one day. But what happens? Here it is. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, him who God healed, him who Yah healed, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah, in his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo? That's Armageddon. Listen, that's the battle here, Armageddon. When he confronted him, then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him, and made him king in his father's place. You know what? I'm going to let you hang on that. Listen. Listen. This is Megiddo that overlooks the valley of Jezreel. I didn't mention earlier, you know, that Jesus, Ezekiel tells us Jesus is going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives and split it. I didn't tell you that, did I? I probably should have brought it up. I had a verse on it. I didn't go there. You can search it out yourself. The Mount of Olives is very significant in end times prophecy. It's getting ready to happen. Listen, I'm not, I, I, let me give you a precursor of this. Look at what's going on here. Let me tell you. Assyria has taken the northern tribes. Assyria was very strong. But now they're becoming weak. Right? And they need help. So they've made a deal with Pharaoh Necho of Egypt to come and help us because Babylon is rising. See, right now, Babylon is rising in the world. It's one world government. Babylon is rising up again. But right here, Babylon is mm. getting strong and is going to destroy Assyria and take over. So they hire Egypt to come help. And for some reason that nobody knows of, Josiah goes out and enters into this battle that he shouldn't have been in. 
And if you go read 2 Chronicles 35, 20, it actually tells you that Pharaoh Necho said, Josiah, God told me to do this. Stop it. God told me to do this. Don't come out of here. And he comes out anyway, and Pharaoh Necho kills him. And it's a picture of you and I in these last days getting into a physical fight. Because what's going on? What's going on? Babylon is rising. America is declining. I don't know. Nowadays. It's one world government. Some people believe it's an economic system. It's the devil. It's the devil. Listen to me. We see the same thing going on, and I'm going to talk about it more next week and open it up for you, but you're going to see that there was a king that we just talked about, Jehoaz, 23 years old. He was on the throne for like three months, and he got put in prison. And what happened? Pharaoh Necho put another king on the throne so that he could rule Jerusalem. And he was the, the, the other king, uh, Elikim, he changed his name to Jehoiakim. He wasn't in control, but he was sitting there as king. And it's the same thing going on in America right now. We have a president, but he is not in control. He's put there so somebody else can rule America. And that's what's going on here. He didn't like Jehoaz, so he took him out, and he put him in prison. And that's what we have spiritually going on in America right now because Babylon's rising. And the other powers are going down, and we're going to have a new uh, leader. The Antichrist is going to rise up, and we're going to have a convergence of everything. That's what's going on right now. That's what we're seeing. And it's all going to end in the Valley of Megiddo. It's going to end in the Battle of Armageddon. It's going to end when those two nations that are together and they're pulling together in order to take over everything in Babylon to rise up, they're going to start fighting each other, in my opinion. They're going, to, they're going to draw together in the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, they fight each other and say, now that we've got rid of everybody else, we have to fight for who's the one world power. And the clouds are going to break open and Jesus is going to come back on white horses with the church and the blood will be up to the bridle of the horses as he kills all the enemies of the cross. Those who would not trust in them. That's at the end of the seven year tribulation. And so I give you a short version. Listen, it's going on here, hidden in the Old Testament, in types, the perfection of its coming in reality. And then there'll be judgment where everything's burned up that we didn't let get burned up now, where God will cast everything into the abyss and he'll rule for a thousand years. Are you ready for this? Are you reading the scriptures? Are you asking God to help you? Are you surrendering to his mighty work and power of the blood of Jesus? Listen, he's all powerful. He's almighty. He can do this. He already knows he's outside of time. You don't have to freak out. You don't have to be in fear. You don't have to wonder or worry. You can surrender and go down to the grave in peace as Josiah does here at 39 before the judgment of the world because Jesus already took our judgment on the cross but if you believe that it's going to affect your life where you surrender and I want to be waiting there on the Mount of Olives or be with him already one or the other don't know how it works a lot of people claim they know how it works I don't know how it works but I know the God that's going to make it work and has done the work for me already and I'm going to surrender to him and try to tell other people about it. And even when I mess up, I'm going to agree with him and let him keep burning out the dross. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we know you're on the throne. We know you are bringing everybody together for that battle of Armageddon. All, all people are coming there. All eyes are looking there. And you're drawing everybody there. You have a hook in their jaw. And we can't wait, Lord. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray you come quickly, Lord Jesus, and take the chosen home. We trust you, Lord. Teach us to be witnesses. Teach us to surrender and allow you to use us for the reconciliation of souls. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Uh -huh.